Hi, welcome everyone to George Mason University's Observatory. I'm Dr. Peter Plafchan. I'm the director of the observatory. Uh, it is now eight o'clock. We're going to slow walk into tonight's virtual evening under the stars to give people some time to get connected, but happy to see all of you here tonight. Uh, to find out more information about our observatory, you can follow us on Twitter at GMU Observatory. You can go to our website at science.gmu.edu slash observatory or email us if you have any questions uh, at gmuobservatory at gmail.com. Uh, we have these public nights on alternating Monday evenings during the academic year. Our um, next event is going to be September 24th in two weeks and our, our, at 8 p.m. Our speaker is going to be Dr. Benny Haldera from the University of Louisville joining us virtually. These events are free and uh, they feature 30 to 45 minute talks appropriate for all ages and interests. And at the conclusion of the talk, we'll have a question and answer session uh, followed by a guided telescope tour of that night's sky. Now tonight, I'm sorry to inform you that it is raining here in Fairfax, Virginia. So we will have a closed dome tour tonight. And certainly when uh, we are able to, um, oh, sorry, I meant to say Thursdays. Um, thank you, Evan, for that question. I should just fix that. My apologies. Um, I did mean to write Thursdays there. I guess I must have made this Monday. Uh, we do have some other events in partnership with the Smithsonian Associates uh, Lecture Series. We're going to have a talk next Tuesday night. Um, you can find more information about that on our website. Our speaker on Tuesday night, when tickets are required from that event, for that event will be uh, Dr. Natalie Hinkle from the uh, Southwest Research Institute is going to be talking on the fall colors of stars. So apologies, I had the wrong information here on this slide. It's alternating Thursday evenings. Uh, here's our GMU Observatory. It's located atop Research Hall on the Fairfax campus of George Mason. And you see this beautiful tower is constructed in 2007. Uh, and the telescope was installed in 2010. We have a control room just next to it. Um, and where we can uh, remotely operate the computer. And we're actually gonna be showing you remote views of that computer and the inside the dome tonight. Uh, here are just an array of celestial objects, nebula, galaxies, and clusters um, of uh, images collected uh, here in the DC area. With all the light pollution, we still are able to capture some beautiful uh, images of our night sky. Uh, we also have a monthly newsletter uh, called The Moon, the uh, Mason Observatory Outreach Newsletter that I encourage you to sign up for. And um, our most recent issue had some interesting uh, discussions in it about uh, crude and robotic space travel and our October issue will be coming out at the end of September. Uh, if you would like, uh, our observatory is supported by um, the public and philanthropists in the DC area. And in order to continue um, excellence in astronomy at Mason, as well as engage in educating the Washington DC community, we do ask for you to consider becoming a patron of the observatory uh, to uh, have deductible donations for support to the observatory, as well as supporting our students uh, that I'll tell you a little about a little bit about in a minute. We have different levels ranging from star all the way up to Big Bang, and I'd like to thank our um, current and new um, um, new Nova cluster and star members, as well as our supernova galaxy and Big Bang uh, patrons of the observatory. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, a new member of our observatory team. Uh, I am the I am the director, and I recently took over from, um, Dr. Harold Geller, who retired this past spring. Uh, and we have a new deputy director observatory, Professor Rob Park. So I'm going to turn it over to him for a couple of minutes to introduce himself. Rob, thank you, Peter. Uh, again, as you said, my name is uh, Dr. Rob Parks, and I and this is my first semester here at. Uh, George Mason University, and I am very excited about being a part of the observatory and the, the family here. Uh, I have been teaching for nearly two decades now, uh, and I'm 
have been a, I suppose, patron of uh, astronomy education and outreach for almost all of that time. And so I am, again, very excited about participating in events like this and just bringing astronomy into people's homes or when they, have, when they can actually visit the observatory uh, there as well. So uh, if you have any questions for me, please uh, let me know in the chat. Um, my research interests at the moment uh, primarily involve uh, astronomy, astronomy education, specifically how to use uh, large tel or, uh, telescopes like our own in improving or in educating undergraduates and uh, graduate students uh, in uh, more rudimentary or fundamental projects uh, moving forward. So, all right. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Parks. Mm -hmm. um, here's a picture of our observatory. Um, and you can see um, uh, some computers in the background there for scale. This is a railing. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our two graduate student observatory assistants, Justin Wittrock and William Matsko, who will be assisting us tonight uh, with our remote um, tour of our telescope. And the many students that we have online tonight, uh, we have a a Friends of the Observatory student organization, and the president of that is Brandon Iverson, uh, and they meet uh, every other Friday night um, currently and uh, have a bunch of events planned. I believe we have a representative from Friends of the Observatory online to tell, a little, tell us a little bit more about um, their student organization. Is that Ashley tonight? Yes, hi, hello. My name is Ashley and I'm a student here at Mason and I am the Secretary of PHOTO, which stands for Friends of the Observatory. Uh, we're a student organization that provides volunteer support to the observatory. Um, that includes general maintenance, uh, inventory, promoting observatory events, and we even host our own virtual uh, Night Under the Stars for students. Uh, we're also all about building a fun and inclusive community. Uh, we have all kinds of virtual events. Uh, we have little t-shirt design contests, game nights, movie nights, and we even teach our members how to use the telescope. So um, we even have a new thing this semester where we're doing a photo contest where students can take pictures of objects in the sky with their own telescopes and submit, um, submit to the contest for prizes. So it's a really fun group of people, and I encourage you to join us for our next meeting on September 18th. Uh, just log on to Mason360 and search Friends of the Observatory, all spelled out. And uh, feel free to reach out to us through Mason360. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks, Ashley. That was wonderful. Uh, we also have uh, uh, tour guides that conduct tours for uh, individuals. If you're a member of the public joining us tonight, we do offer uh, free private tours to, to those who are interested. Right now they're virtual. Um, and we also have tours for our general education courses here in astronomy. And so we have a number of students who are, who are tour guides um, and are familiar with using the observatory and sharing our love of the night sky with everyone. So once again, uh, please follow on Twitter. You can email us for more information or visit our website at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. We're happy to have everyone joining us virtually tonight. We're hoping you are all safe healthy and well. It is my pleasure to now introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Thane Curry is a scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center and the Subaru Telescope uh, located atop Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Uh, he completed his PhD at Harvard working with Dr. Scott Kenyon. His research is on the direct imaging of exits, advancing data analysis and instrumentation techniques to improve the sensitivity and our ability to detect planets around other stars. He's gonna give us a talk, and if you have questions during his talk, feel free to put them in the chat on Zoom, and we will answer those questions at the end um, of the talk. And uh, Dr. Curry, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, let's see if I can share a screen properly. You'll see the entire presentation in reverse. Obviously, it's not. Okay. 
Okay, can everybody see, everybody see this uh, just fine? Okay, very good. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for coming to listen, listen to me uh, present today. And um, it's an honor to be here. So today, today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I consider to be one of the most exciting areas um, in science, not just simply in astronomy. And that is focusing on trying to understand planets around nearby stars. And in particular, trying to image them. And we do this work on a number of, of sites uh, throughout the Earth and in space. I'm going to be focusing on our efforts to be able to directly image planets uh, from atop Mauna Kea. And you see this very nice image of the summit of Mauna Kea with the super telescope on the right and the twin Keck telescopes on the left uh, against a beautiful backlit sky. Yeah. So I think before we get into the science of uh, direct imaging and of extrasolar planets in general, why is this area of interesting? What kind of draws us? For me, I think the reason is because astronomy in general probes fundamental philosophical questions, you know, the kind that all of us contemplate. And extrasolar planets in particular are at the center of those key human questions. So I like to think of it more as not so much a discipline of science, but as a human endeavor whose answers can be in large part provided by science. So there's been a long debate over uh, how the universe is comprised and how the earth relates to that. So for a very long time, the ancients argued about whether or not there can be more than one earth. So for example, Aristotle taking the position that the earth is unique if there's only one. Others like Epicurus argue that no, in fact, there are an infinite number of worlds. You know, some of them like the earth, some of them unlike it. You know, and this is not just simply um, a debate that goes on over one small area of the globe. But this is over humanity in general. So for example, you can, you can find philosophers in China doing the same thing. One of my personal favorites is Imam Arazi uh, during the high middle ages in Afghanistan. He had this beautiful quote saying that the most high is the power to create a thousand thousands of worlds. And beyond this, each having the earth, the sun, and the moon. And with the telescope, you can provide some of the answers to these questions. So for example, this is showing a sketch from uh, Galileo in the 17th century, showing the positions of four moons surrounding Jupiter. Identifying evidence that Jupiter actually in some ways almost like a mini solar system, which kind of gives us an idea that, well, maybe, you know, the universe is a little bit more complicated than we thought. And there may be more iterations or permutations of the way in which the universe is organized beyond just simply having the Earth, a few planets, and a fixed sphere of stars. But I mean, think beyond that, not just simply whether or not the Earth is unique, we want to understand how it came to be. How did we get here? And then also, are we alone? And this is also a long-standing question. So the Kumalipa, which is the Hawaiian chant of creation, uh, has this beautiful quote that describes how the earth came to be, you know, how it came from the source of deepest darkness, from the time of Po, you know, of the darkness of the sun, the depth of the night, it is night, so night was born. You know, this well predated and had no contact at all with European explorers. This is entirely a separate tradition. And others, you know, go, would further ponder, you know, what kinds of planets would these be, whether there may be, they, whether they or not may be inhabited. So a lot of you are probably uh, familiar with uh, Giordano Bruno. There are others. This is Cardinal Nicholas Cassanus. He's a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church argue that, well, rather than so many parts of the stars and the heavens are uninhabited, perhaps we will suppose that in every region there are uninhabited. So, so he actually went on to muse about whether, what kinds of people would be on the surface of the sun, arguing, for example, that the sun should be inhabited by enlightened intelligence beings based, uh, basking in the glow of the sun, whereas those inhabiting the moon on the dark side we're in perpetual darkness and we're in fact lunatics. So 500 years after you know, the lunatics on the moon uh, that Carnot uh, Nicholas Acuza mused about, we finally found our first evidence that in fact stars around other stars had their own planetary systems. 
most of these detections were identified indirectly. So these figures are showing the two major indirect methods. So the top is the radial velocity method, where by Newton's second law, you know, the planet in, exerts an acceleration upon the star. It has its own gravitational pull. And if you monitor the position of spectral lines for the star, you can identify a periodic shift in the position of those lines. So this is the Doppler shift. This can be mapped on to the mass and the orbital properties of that planet. And the second case is the transit method, which is even more straightforward, which is simply that um, the planetary system is oriented such that the planet passes in front of the star along our line of sight. It causes a dip in the planet plus star system brightness. And then the planet can pass behind the star and cause a secondary eclipse measurement. These together can give us information about the orbital properties of the planet, the radius of the planet, and even some information about the atmosphere of the planet due to the secondary eclipse measurement. And one of these examples is actually uh, a recent work from Peter that was uh, published in, um, I think got I think press on CNN and a lot of other outlets. So these methods together have identified a lot of planets. It appears that planet formation is just what happens when stars form. So for example, for one mission alone, this is from the Kepler spacecraft, I've identified over 4,000 candidate planets. You know, these spanning three orders of magnitude of range in both separation and size, all the way from planets more massive and larger than Jupiter to less than the size of the Earth from a day orbital period to hundreds of days orbital periods. And so planet formation is common. This appears to be what happens when the stars form, as I said before. And these indirect techniques have provided the backbone of our understanding of the demographics of planetary systems, you know, how statistically, uh, what planetary systems are like. So whereas I think this is very exciting, you know, it's provided a lot of inf our information about the inventory of planets. Following is really more what I'm a little bit after. So the image you see here is what you would get if you were 10 parsecs away, so we're roughly about 32.6 light years away from the Earth, and you use a really powerful telescope and you look back at the solar system. The sun's light is blocked by a chronograph, and off axis you can see two point sources, Venus and then Earth. So furthermore, if you take light and separate it out by wavelength, you get a spectrum. You see this for the Earth. So biomarkers, it's like oxygen, ozone, and water. So evidence that the Earth is capable of supporting life. This method, direct imaging, is a key method, I think potentially the only method by which we may be able to identify, confirm, and characterize a true Earth twin around a nearby sun-like star, and even possibly a, the only method, or at least a key method, by which we're able to identify an Earth twin around the nearest stars, which are typically lower mass and cooler than the suns. So my talk's gonna be focusing on doing this kind of science in one particular place that I find special, which is the Mauna Kea. So I'll talk a little bit about why we want to do direct imaging here in Mauna Kea in Hawaii, some of the challenges with the field of direct imaging, and why is this hard, and how we overcome these challenges through a novel set of observing and image processing techniques, and then something called adaptive optics. I'll talk a little bit what we generally learn from direct imaging about extrasolar planets. We'll focus on how the architectures of planets, planetary systems we can image compared to the architecture of our own solar system. I'll talk about the atmospheres of these, of these planets, how they differ from our expectations, and also show some uh, cool movies of how these planets move. I'll talk a little bit then about the next step with imaging exosolar planets. In particular, a project I'm involved with at the Subaru Telescope, which is called the Subaru Chronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics Project. How it allows us to better characterize known planetary systems. I'll give some examples that are unpublished as of right now of new discoveries with Skuxio. And I'll talk a little bit about how its technology once honed and improved a little bit and then put on a larger telescope, we'll eventually be able to get us to the point where, where we could image an Earth twin around some of the nearest stars. So first, where are we trying to do this science? 
So this is from uh, Mauna Kea. This is a Google Earth image. Mauna Kea is a shield volcano. It covers actually one fourth of the island. From base to summit, it would be over 33,000 feet. That's higher than Mount Everest. Now it's a shield volcano, which means it's very gently sloping. So this is not like the Rocky Mountains or you know, what you typically think of with the mountain range. Now, if we zoom in much closer, we can see this. And so if you actually go to observe on Mauna Kea, you go up this little access road called the Mauna Kea Access Road, and you pass through these features, which are called pu'u. So these are cinder cones left over from tens of thousands of years ago when Mauna Kea was an active volcano. And the names of these cinder cones are associated with different, different deities or uh, culture, uh, has uh, cultural significance. So for example, Pu Poliahu is named after the goddess of the mist, Poliahu. Her younger sister is Lolanoi. And Pu Pohaku, Kukahalula, which is the true summit of Mauna Kea, was named after the red-hued snow, the, the summit. And then Lake Waiau, which is also is associated with a goddess. The reason why Mauna Kea is a great site for doing this kind of science is because of its geography. So this image gives you a clear indication of uh, why, what you might imagine. If you can see here, the dome of the Keck telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea is above the cloud layer. Unlike many mountains, Mauna Kea has a marine layer, what's called an inversion layer, where the air is actually cooler and drier above than below. So this means that the air is dry, it's cool, you can have a very large fraction of nights that are clear, and it also allows a block or a blanket over the city lights from Hilo, Kailua, Kona, and Waimea below. So the sky is also very dark. And to kind of give you a sense of how high up Mount Mauna Kea is, and how sort of otherworldly it is, the mountain that you see in the background, that's actually Haleakala. That is on a different island. It's not on the island of Hawaii, that's on Maui. So you can see way far away from this height. And the kind of conditions you get um, are usually very good. Sometimes they can be absurdly good. So for those of you who are astronomers in the audience, for example, we can get an seeing in the optical um, less than half an arc second. I've seen seeing conditions as good as 0.18 arc seconds from Mauna Kea. It's pretty ridiculous. We have very low wind, clear skies, cool temperatures, and little water vapor in the atmosphere. All these things combined together allow us to address the significant challenge of direct imaging, which I'll get to in a little bit, just a little bit easier. So I also wanted to add too that, you know, this is a mountain that is shared. This is not just for astronomers and far from it. It has a very long history. So there are people who go to Mauna Kea for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do directly with, with astronomy, as I'll describe in the rest of the talk, but for, uh, but for cultural or religious gatherings. So for example, on the right, you have a figure of somebody using, uh, having an offering at a lele, I think on Pulu Palayahu. The top left is Lake Waiau, which the waters are considered significant to some cultural practitioners. And the bottom left is actually the ads quarry. So this is, what this actually is, is essentially a mining operation that occurred uh, hundreds of years before the arrival of Captain Cook to Hawaii, where, the, uh, where Hawaiians used this region to excavate rock for stone tools and weapons, you know, basically use, using the blessings of the land to their advantage. So that kind of gives you a sense of why Mauna Kea is great, great and makes, thing, makes our task easier is still a significant challenge. So to kind of describe this, what I'm showing on the, on the axis here is the planet to star contrast ratio. It's gonna be a concept I'm going to refer back to many times. And along the X axis is the apparent separation of objects. So this is in, in units of arc seconds. So you can kind of think of this like the angle on the sky separating two objects. So for reference, if you take a really bright light bulb and you take a lightning bug or something with, that, that still emits light, you put it 1.5 centimeters away, away. The contrast is roughly between about 10 minus four and 10 minus six or so. 
So it's pretty steep. Now imagine instead of having this, um, this light bulb and this lightning bulb right in front of you, imagine taking that, putting it on the runway of Reagan, Reagan Airport, and then trying to separate out those two sources of light. That's very similar to qualitatively the kind of challenge uh, we're facing with the first directly image planets. And to be able to image something like a true solar system analog, the challenge is even steeper. So they're way down here. So the Earth is at a contrast uh, between it and the Sun of two times two to the minus 10. And the Jupiter is only at a contrast of one part in a billion. So this seems hopeless, but we can make our challenge a little bit easier, uh, at least to start with, by observing different kinds of planetary systems. So for example, around a low mass star, or like the nearest stars, like Proxima Centauri or so, you know, an Earth at, um, in the habitable zone has a contrast of only about 10 to minus seven to 10 to minus eight. And a Jupiter roughly the same at a separation between the sun and the Earth. Furthermore, if we focus on young planets, our task becomes slightly easier. So for example, Jupiter, when it was young, was hotter and more luminous. So its contrast with respect to its host star would be more mild, and thus the planet would be easier to disentangle from light from the star. And when you get up to planets that are more massive than Jupiter, the task is slightly even, easier even still. So these are gonna be like the first kinds of planets we're able to image. Now to be able to separate out the sources of light from the ground, from ground based telescope, we need a little bit of help. Because even from the calmest sites like Mauna Kea or Cerro Paranal in Chile, the atmosphere is still turbulent, it's still bubbling, it still blurs out starlight. It's because you know, it, that's why stars twinkle. So we use something called adaptive optics to be able to help us, to be able to disentangle sources of light, to be able to see really faint things next to really bright things. So this is showing an example of an adaptive optics system from the Palomar Telescope in California. So on the left, you have this sort of bright smudge. It looks sort of nondescript. With an adaptive optics system, what you do, you have what's called a wavefront sensor, which tries to figure out how the atmosphere is blurring light. And then it sends that information to a deformable mirror. So this is different than like a typical hand mirror you may have. This is a mirror that can move up and down, that can reshape using many, many different actuators. And so using information from the wavefront sensor, you're able to reshape the mirror to be able to, to first order cancel out how the atmosphere is blurring the starlight. In this particular case, you can get very sharp images of, star, of these two stars. You can see that this is actually a binary star system, pair of stars instead of a single star system. So seems easy enough, straightforward enough. Why don't we just use an adaptive optic system, an AO system, and just look at a star for a really long time and then we'll just see planets, right? Should be simple. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Here's an example of why. This is an image with the Keck telescope with the NERC-2 camera. So this is our science system on, on, the, on the back of the telescope at H-band, which is at 1.6 microns. These data were taken in 2005 before the discovery of the first directly imaged planets. And what you see in the image, the central part region is actually where the coronagraph is placed, which sort of partially blocks out starlight. And regions outside of this coronagraph, so like this sort of very large donut shaped region, that is the scattered light from the stellar halo. So that is partially uncorrected by the adaptive optic system. What I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna subtract off a radial profile of this image. Basically put an unsharp mask of the, of the image in, which you might be familiar with if you do astrophotography. You'll see what's left over and you'll see immediately why directly imaging planets is hard. So this is what's left over. So this very bright and dark pattern, this is quasi-static speckle noise. So this is due to nanometer scale imperfections in the telescope optics. You know, changes in the temperature, changes in the wind, all sorts of different sources. But the key thing to know about this 
is that this is quasi-static, which means that it, it stays rather fixed. So if you take an image now, and take an image 15 minutes later, most of this noise remains. What that means is that you could observe for however long you want, and it'll be very difficult to get below this noise level. And the problem is that the brightness of planets we're wanting to image is typically below the intensity of the speckle noise. So how do we figure out, figure out a way around this? So the first method that's actually been, that has been proven successful for this is actually absurdly simple. So if you take a camera, you point it at Polaris, the North Star, and you take a very long series exposure, you'll see this, you'll see star trails. And then, you know, this is because the Earth rotates. And in particular, in this case, objects located off axis from Polaris change in their position angle, you know, their, their sort of uh, north, south, east, west position as a function of time. Okay. Now, if you observe with a telescope like Keck or with Subaru or with any other large telescope or even a small one um, that, that does science, um, you typically have a way of compensating for this, which is what is called an image rotator. And that's typically good because that means that light from your galaxy won't get smudged out. For example, you could have like an edge on galaxy that doesn't accidentally turn into an elliptical galaxy. Okay. But we can turn that feature off and doing that will actually help us image planets better. To illustrate, here is an image again with Keck. I'm going to saturate this. Now, if we had the image rotator turned up, turn on, you would see this entire structure rotate. Watch what happens when I, we turn the image rotator off. What you see is this pattern staying fixed is not rotating. It's just kind of fluctuating a little bit. And if you look very closely at about the six o'clock position, right at the bottom of the screen, you'll see this little dot moving from left to right. That is actually a directly imaged planet. Okay, that you can just barely see in this image stretch. So what happens then, if you observe in this mode where you turn the image rotator off, what is called angular differential imaging, you could take an image at time equals one, an image at time equals two, and you're able to subtract off most of this speckle noise without removing the light from the planet. It's actually pretty clever. You can go actually even further by using clever software to be able to figure out how to do this ideally. So if we go back to our uh, movie again, notice now how the image is changing. You can see the halo of the light kind of fluctuating, kind of getting brighter, getting dimmer. Maybe some small parts of it are slightly changing. So you'd imagine then that, that for a given image, there may be different ideal ways of combining the other images that will best subtract out that noise. And you use a bunch of linear algebra trickery to figure out what that ideal combination is. You can further uh, add to this by exploiting what's called principal component analysis, or even doing simple frame selection, where you, where you use a, only a subset of images that appear to best match the noise pattern of the given science image for which you're wanting to subtract out the noise. Okay. Hope that makes sense to everybody. So we move objects, frames that look like this, and retain the upper two frames. So from start to finish, this is what it looks like. You have your directly image planetary system with speckle noise. And then you get this leftover. Okay, so you get this beautiful image of three planets surrounding a, uh, a nearby star. So these are HR8799, B, C, and D. These are the first uh, directly imaged planets. And this is actually the uh, image that you get left over doing that. Okay. Now, if you reobserve the system a little bit longer, maybe tune your experiment a little bit better, observe it at a different wavelength, you can detect a fourth planet in the system, HR8799E. And these planets are dynamic things. They actually move. You see this move. So the quote above is actually from supposedly from Galileo when he was put under house arrest for 
uh, not recanting uh, the Earth-centered universe. This is a time series of H-rate 799 uh, from 2009, several years forward. So you can actually see all four of these planets move counterclockwise. And what's really interesting actually is that the, it appears that the orbits of these planets are configured such that they lie in what's called an orbital resonance. So four to two to one, eight to four to two to one orbital resonance. So in some way it was almost like the planets kind of know about each other. Here's an image of the inventory of the planets we'll be able to identify from direct imaging. You know, so there's a nice variety of these, depending on who you talk to, they're gonna either be between about 12 to 25 directly imaged planets. The ones in green were discovered in whole or in part from Mauna Kea. Okay. And these, the ones in magenta have been followed up and have been re-imaged from Mauna Kea as well. So this one mountain has played a very important a seemingly outsized role in our understanding of these objects. So that's great. What do we learn about these systems? So the first thing I'll focus on is the architecture of these planetary systems. Okay. So to kind of give you a reference point, here's the inner solar system. We have the sun, four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Earth. And you, then you have, they're all located interior to the asteroid belt, roughly about 2.7 AU. Outside of that are the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And outside of that is the Kuiper belt of which Pluto is the largest, uh, the largest object. Okay. So how do these planetary systems compare to our own solar system? So I'll take three examples that kind of give you a range of uh, scale. So here's Kappa Andromeda, 51 Ari, and Rocks 42b. This is how the solar system would compare to each one of these three planetary systems. So for Kappa Andromeda b, its planet would be located just outside of the Kuiper belt. If you took our own solar system and, and superimposed it. For 51 Ari, it's located at roughly about 10 AU. So roughly about the separation between the sun and Saturn. Okay. But unlike the solar system, it appears like there's only one planet, at least one, only one that we can see thus far on this star named 51 area. Rocks 42b is even weirder because you take the entire solar system, it would fit with this very small region and the planet would be located much, much further out at about 140 astronomical units, so almost like five times the distance between uh, the sun and uh, Neptune or Pluto. Now we do have planetary systems uh, where we've imaged more than one. So there have been a few of these, H-rate 799 being the ch chief one. If we compare it to the solar system, it still looks a little bit weird. So all four of these planets, so all four of these massive planets are typically on larger scales than the planets that are in our own solar system. So the innermost planet, H-rate 799e, is located at a distance similar to the distance between the sun and Uranus. And the furthermost planet, h 799b, would be located outside of the Kuiper belt. So this is kind of weird. It almost seems like you know, the solar system is the odd one out. But if you look at this issue in a slightly different way, you do see some similar similarities. So h 799 the star around which all these planets orbit, is an A star. It is hotter, it is more massive, and it is brighter than the sun. So if you take the positions of the planets around H-rate 799, and you scale it to the ratio of the amount of light that the sun receives versus the amount of light that they receive, you actually see some similarities. So in the solar system, we have an asteroid belt, four massive planets, and then a Kuiper belt. H-rate 799 has an asteroid belt, four massive planets, and a Kuiper belt. So you'd almost think of this as like a scaled up or jumbo version of our own solar system. Now we can also learn something in detail about these, uh, about these planets individually as astrophysical objects. So to kind of give you a sense of context, 
This is a paper I pulled from 1931 studying Jupiter. It's a good old Jupiter. We've known about Jupiter uh, for thousands of years. You know, it's the fifth planet from the sun. You know, it's basically right in our backyard, 5.2 AU. So this is showing a spectrum of Jupiter. And the authors in this case use that spectrum to kind of contemplate you know, what was in the atmosphere of Jupiter. So the planets around HR8799, a lot of these other directly imaged planets, are far further away than Jupiter is from the sun. You know, so we can send a probe to Jupiter in a few years. It would take tens of thousands of years at best to visit even the nearest directly imaged planetary system. But we know more about the atmosphere of some of these planets than we did about Jupiter in the early 20, earliest parts of the 20th century. So what have we learned? So one, we can actually study clouds in the atmospheres of these planets. So clouds do peculiar things to how bright the planet is at different wavelengths. So the left is showing an example where we have data points for HR8799b in the outermost of these planets. So that's shown in blue. Magenta is showing the predictions for how bright this planet is at different wavelengths. If it, had, if it had very thin clouds, which would be kind of similar to other substellar objects that are called brown dwarfs, which had roughly the same temperatures we believe this planet has. And what you see is that the prediction for that model, where we have these very thin clouds at depth, does not match the data that we see at all. So it actually over predicts the brightness at the shortest wavelengths and under predicts the brightness at other places. And just also for reference, this is all in the infrared. So this is that wavelength slightly longer than the wavelengths that we can see with our naked eye. Now, if you put clouds in the atmosphere of the planet and then you drive up the clouds, you make the clouds very thick. And so sort of think about, you know, not like a nice sunny day with cirrus clouds, but instead of think of like, you know, the atmosphere of Venus, where the clouds are very thick. The shape of the spectrum looks very different. It looks more like a black body. If you're, if you're familiar with that term, it looks flatter. And it changes how light is redistributed as a function of wavelength. But we're able to get a much better match to the, to the, uh, between the model and the data. But this just one change in our assumption. We can also study the chemistry of these planets. So for example, this is taking a spectrum of HR799C with the Keck telescope at very high resolution. So we're dividing up that light very, very finely. The data is in red, so along, uh, along the middle part of the plot, the best fit model is in black. And then we see contributions from different molecules from that model. And what it looks like, it looks like we can actually identify evidence for water and carbon monoxide in this planet that is over 120 light years away. And not just simply identify, but we can sort of quantify how much there is. And so provide some es estimate for the abundance of these molecules. And it turns out actually that the abundance of some of these molecules um, taken together, in particular what is called the carbon to oxygen ratio, may actually tell us a little bit about how these planets formed and where they formed. So that kind of gives you a sense of what we've been able to do thus far with directly imaging planets, especially those from Mauna Kea. Um, sort of very generally what the challenges are, how we overcome them, very generally what we've uh, been able to find out. So what does the future look like? You know, so the plot here, again, is a planet to star contrast ratio plot. And this is showing the brightness of directly imaged planets in yellow compared to the planet to star contrast ratio for different instruments associated with the Hubble Space Telescope and recent ground-based telescopes. You know, so for example, the Keck Telescope, the Gemini South Telescope, the Very Large Telescope. Okay. We're still very far away from the kind of planet to star contrasts we need in order to be able to image true solar system analogs. 
To me, the exciting thing is that we're making great strides in closing this gap. So I'm gonna focus most of the rest of this talk on the path to be able to get there. Where a lot of the ground that we're gonna be able to make up is through new systems that are coming online right now, including one that I'm gonna be talking about a lot, which is called the Subaru Chronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics Project. It will substantially increase our ability to image planets, and if we hone the technology we're testing out right now with, with Skexio and put it on a larger telescope, for example, extremely large telescope, we might be able to image solar system-like planets around the nearest low mass stars. And we apply some of this technology or variations of this technology with NASA missions in space, we could perhaps do the same thing for, a, for planets around sun-like stars. Okay, so how do we get there? The major advance, and the thing that's really driving this change is a technology called extreme adaptive optics. So the difference between extreme adaptive optics and sort of regular good old adaptive optics is that with an extreme AO system, the number of actuators on your mirror is far higher. So you have a lot of different actuators across the telescope pupil. What that means is you're able to get a much finer, more robust cancellation of the starlight blurring that the atmosphere induces. And furthermore, typically extreme AO systems run faster. So for example, you know, a typical facility adaptive optic system that you find at CAC or at Subaru might run at about 500 Hertz. Or so. Extremio systems can run much, much faster than that, which is important because the atmosphere is not only blurring starlight, but it is turbulent. So the way in which it is blurring starlight changes as a function of time. Now, with an extremio system, what happens is that the light that normally would go into the halo, you know, that produces all these speckles and makes you know, our, our life hard, um, that light gets pushed more and more into the core of what's called the point spread function for the star. So basically how light is distributed uh, on, your, on your scientific instrument. And the light that is located off axis starts to drop then, the intensity starts to drop. And eventually you create what is called a dark hole where you can really get deep contrasts and you can image planets much more easily. So this is our system to be able to do that. This is called the Subaru Chronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics Project, Subaru Telescope. The PI for this instrument is Olivier Guillon, who is shown at the right, along with the image of the Subaru Telescope. It uses a different type of AO system, wavefront sensor, than what is normally used. It's called a pyramid wavefront sensor. And the thing that's important for you to know about that is it allows us to run our AO system faster and allows us to get a much less noisy measurement of how the atmosphere is blurring starlight. It's able to do this, do this at high fidelity. So, so correcting for over 1,000 modes, 1,000 spatial frequencies. You're able to do this very fast at over 3.5 kilohertz. It's able to get very sharp images of stars. So we can see faint objects located off, off axis. You know, a way of quantifying this is something called the Stroll Ratio, which is basically how much light is in the center, the core of the star, compared to the theoretical limit. And it's coupled with science instruments. You know, we're not just simply get really sharp images of stars, but we have science instruments to be able to record data for planets around those stars. So this is in particular using an instrument called an integral field spectrograph. Now, unlike a regular camera, that you may have. An integral field spectrograph is different because it actually allows us you to get a spectrum at every single location on your image plane. So it's almost like a combination of a, of a simple long slit spectrograph and an imager. You can see this on the right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to march out from short wavelengths to long wavelengths with this integral field spectrograph. There's four little uh, circles uh, that you see, that is actually a pattern uh, that we deliberately put on the image to allow us to be able to precisely center the star and get precise uh, calibration for uh, photometry and spectroscopy. 
you see this sort of strobe light effect, where you see this entire pattern move out as a function of time. If you look really closely, you can actually see you know, a very faint object located about the, um, about the eight o'clock position on this image. So that's actually a brown dwarf. And what that means with the instrument, that we can get an instantaneous spectrum of that brown dwarf or any object located anywhere else on this image plane with our, with our uh, uh, integral field spectrograph. And furthermore, if you notice carefully with that movie, you'll see that it really kind of looks like it's the same pattern expanded and contracted. So your eyes are not deceiving you, that's true. So we'll play it again in a slightly different contrast or image stretch. So see this, see the satellite grid, those four dots move out. You'll see the pattern from the halo, residual halo from the star move out. And then you'll see also this very faint brown dwarf located off axis. Watch what happens now. Instead of we use just our normal movie of this, we go from short wavelengths to long wavelengths. If we take every single slice of the spectrograph and we rescale that image by the ratio of the, that wavelength to the wavelength of the first channel, we see this. The pattern seems to be kind of fixed, right? But you see a real source, like a planet or a brown dwarf, move inwards or outwards on this image. So this allows us to, to do a technique called spectral differential imaging, which in combination with angular differential imaging, allows us to do very well in suppressing whatever residual light is left over. Here's what we can do. So this is our system HR8799, the one I've shown many times before. On the left is an image with Skexio. On the right is an image with Keck at the same wavelength. And what you see is that the Keck image is only able to identify planet C at a very clear level and sort of detect planet D. And planet E is undetected. But with Skexia, we're able to identify all three planets extremely clearly. And so it's able to improve over sort of our run-of-the-mill facility systems by over a factor of 100 at small separations where we're trying to look for planets. And even compared to some of the other leading systems, Skexio is at least equal and is soon surpassing them. So this is an example from an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager, which some of you may have heard about. So what science can we do with Skexio that we couldn't do before? So one, we can actually study the spectra of planets to get different kinds of information about them. So this is an example for Kappa Andromeda B. We have this very clear detection of a planet. Uh, as you can see at about the 11 o'clock position. If we get a spectrum for it, what we find is that its spectrum, which is in black, looks most similar to young, low mass objects with a low surface gravity. And you see that in particular with the, the region between about 1.4 and 1.8 microns, where it looks much more triangular or peaky than would an older object, which is shown in gray. Okay, so this actually gives us some information about uh, what the likely age of the system is, and more, uh, and, and more beyond that, what the gravity, the actual surface gravity of that planet is. We can also detect new things. So none of these results are published, but since you were nice enough to invite me to give a talk, uh, you'll, you'll see them before most of the astronomy community sees them. So on the left, we have a directly imaged companion detected very easily. We get a spectrum for it. We see this really uh, sort of wavy pattern to that spectrum for that planet. So the up and down parts of this spectrum are actually shaped by water in the atmosphere of this planet, okay? And it's, it appears to be around a sun-like star at a separation sort of comparable to Uranus and Neptune around uh, our, own, uh, our own sun. We've also detected a planet that appears to be not just you know, there, is still in the process of being assembled. So uh, for those who are actually are astronomers and may have access to Twitter or whatever, I've deliberately masked other features of this image on the top right, so you can't identify which system this is. 
but we've re-imaged this little weird point-like source about eight times now. And it appears to be evidence for a planet that's currently in the process of being assembled, being formed, and per perhaps can provide clues about planet formation in general. And the case on the lower right actually shows uh, what we believe is a new directly imaged planet. And this is you know, a dynamic field. Uh, two of these three images were taken with, within the last few days. Okay, so we have a lot of work in progress. So in addition to doing science, you know, characterizing known systems, and discovering new ones, Skexio is, is kind of a sort of mobile laboratory for doing direct imaging better. And it is, allows us to mature a new technology we're going to need to be able to image planets around old stars like the sun, which will be in reflected light instead of thermal emission, planets that are lower mass, more difficult to detect. Now, this is going to be driven by new technologies in, in a wide range of, of ways. So one, we're actually coupling Skexio to different kinds of detectors. In particular, the one that we're testing right, right now is called a microkinetic inductance detector, or MKIDS detector. The important point to know about this is, is that on one hand, all cameras or detectors have noise, you know, like read noise or other pattern noise. An MKIDS detector is different. It essentially has no read noise. So that you can get a really, really high fidelity image of what you're looking at, okay? And that detector is so good, we can actually then use it both as a science camera and also to do wavefront sensing using a method called focal plane wavefront sensing. So all the AO systems or adaptive optic systems I've been talking about uh, in the prior 47 minutes, those are all upstream of the, um, the science instrument they're using, all right? So the AO system, since it's all atmosphere, the atmosphere is blurring starlight, it corrects for that, sends that corrective starlight to uh, a science camera. There's still some things that happen in between uh, or along that path, in between that corrective starlight to the camera that can mess up your image, okay? Different sources of, uh, of error. And so if you use both that normal AO system component and focal plane wavefront sensing, you can remove a lot of that residual uh, noise or uh, uncorrected starlight. Now it's not enough just simply to remove it, it has to stay removed. And so we're also using Skexio to test out new software or wafer control methods. There's one I've been working on called linear dark field control. So you have a low noise detector, you're able to do different types of methods to be able to, to dig a really deep contrast to image planets and you're able to freeze that state for a long time. You can see how that might be very, very powerful. And so if you take all this technology together, it will do great science with the current telescopes. If you put this on a larger telescope, it'll be even more powerful. So the next decade or so, we'll see the uh, construction and we'll see the implementation of three very large telescopes. There's the European Extremely Large Telescope, in Chile, the 30 meter telescope planned for Hawaii, and then there's the Giant Magellan Telescope uh, also planned for Chile. All these telescopes are significantly larger than even the largest optical infrared ground-based telescopes that are in operation today. So for example, GMT has a mirror where its effective collecting, your, collect, sorry, its effective diameter is two and a half times the size of Keck. That's a substantial advantage and you'll be able to get much sharper images of stars, be able to look much more sensitively for planets that you could do, do with even the best current telescopes. So if you take a system like Skexio and put it on one of these larger telescopes, I believe the performance is actually good enough that we could directly detect an Earth in the habitable zone around some of the nearest stars, where some can range between one, if we're really pessimistic, to over 20, if we're optimistic. And this is just with one of these extremely large telescopes. If we combine both of them together, we can identify many, many more. So that's my talk. Um, I tried to communicate a little bit about 
imaging planets around other stars. In particular, doing this from Mauna Kea. Talked a little bit about why we want to do science here. You know, what is special? Uh, what is gifted to us as humanity in terms of its conditions? The loss that it makes it a very, very good astronomical site, in particular for this kind of astronomy. Talked about the science, sorry, the challenge with uh, direct imaging and how we overcome these challenges through really novel uh, instrumentation, adaptive optic systems, and also novel observing and image processing techniques. Talked about what we've learned about direct imaging, including the architectures of these systems, the atmospheres, those will show some orbits of these systems. And then I've talked about the next step with imaging extrasolar planets using cutting edge dedicated planet imaging systems. I described one of these at Subaru, how we're able to better characterize known systems, provide new discoveries, and then put us on the path to be able to imaging, imaging into the Earth. Now, the final point I want to make is that all this work is an enormous undertaking. And there are a lot of people involved with our project. But I think really the unsung heroes of you know, an observatory, and in particular a project like this, are other people who work at the observatory, you know, the general staff. They've been doing amazing work. So as you, many of you know, a lot of the observatories in Chile are shuttered. Observatories in Arizona have trouble. Lick Observatory almost burned down. You know, the world's kind of seeming like it's falling apart a little bit. And Hawaii is no different. So the unemployment rate in Hawaii reached over 22% this summer. They've seen a 98% drop in, tur in tourism. It's tough times. But even in these tough times, you have incredible work by the staff of all of these observatories. So, for example, the guy on the top left, Matt, actually fixed Keras when we had a freak power outage at Subaru. The guy in the middle left, Kayana, is the best IT person I've ever dealt with. He's responsible for allowing us to communicate with all these, uh, all these instruments securely without getting hacked and keeping all the computers up and running. Using software then that Eric on the far right created to be able to allow us to be able to do observing from our living room. And all these people together uh, through all the different methods con contributed uh, to being able to make Skexio a success and other observatories of success, including the Keck Observatory. And while they're doing this, they're also giving back to the community. They're doing incredible work, donating to the food basket, putting masks, you know, and providing these to the community. So if there's nothing else that you come away from this talk, besides the fact that exoplanets are cool and imaging them are great, if you do have time at, observa at an observatory in Hawaii, or really elsewhere, anytime coming up, make sure to be very appreciative, be thankful. They're doing incredible work and they are integral to, to presenting anything I have today. So I'll be with that and take any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Curry. That was an excellent talk. You can clap for Dr. Curry with your reactions button in Zoom <laughs> to, uh, to offer some claps up. Uh, uh, thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, so if you have questions for Dr. Curry, uh, please type them in the chat. We have had a couple during the talk and, and Dr. Parks provided some tentative answers. I want to revisit a couple of them uh, and ask you, Dr. Curry, while we're doing that, um, our students are going to get ready for our uh, remote tour of our observatory and we'll turn it over to them soon. Uh, the first question uh, came from Evan Timorous, or Timinus. Uh, what is the smallest exoplanet you are currently capable of detecting? That's a great question. Sure. So right now, the, all these planets we've been able to detect to direct detect directly, so we're seeing direct light from them, are more massive than Jupiter, and we think their radii are also a little bit larger than Jupiter's radius. Um, that part is a little bit of a conjecture, but you know the the estimate that we have is that, you know, these are probably scaled up versions of Jupiter. Um, so I think the least mass of planet we'd be able to directly detect is 51 Ari B, which is probably about two Jovian masses. Now there is an object, Fomalhaut B, which I listed as a directly imaged planet, but what we're probably seeing is actually light around a circumplanetary disk, or like a collisional satellite swarm around something that we cannot directly see. So that object is really unclear. And there are even some questions about whether that is actually a planet or just a, a really bright, rare collision between two 
you know, icy planetesimals. So if you look at it that way, then that would be the smallest planet that you've imaged. But um, in general, you know, they're all scaled up versions of Jupiter, but we hope to change that very soon with uh, systems like Skeksia. Great. Um, related to Skexio, so uh, kind of an interesting question from Jonathan Saldana. Saldana. Um, so a system like Skexio is not needed on space-based telescopes. So what role does space play in uh, the future of direct imaging? Sure. Okay. Sure. So, so the, the key difference between space and the ground is space doesn't have, the, have an atmosphere. And so you don't need you know, a, a system with a deformable mirror to work at a kilohertz or two kilohertz, you know. There are, there is a need for um, a active wafer control or like a different mobile mirror in space if you're wanting to get very deep contrast with, you know, a chronograph. So for example, the Roman Space Telescope, which is an upcoming NASA mission, does have a different mobile mirror, which can in principle run very fast. You know, and, and so it does, that does allow us to be able to directly detect planets better. You know, and because you're in space, the conditions are more stable than they are on, are on the ground. And so you can imagine in some cases you can get significantly deeper contrast and see planets that you can't see on the ground um, at very wide separations. Okay. But the two are actually sort of harmonious. So a lot of the technology that we're testing out on the ground with Skexio and other instruments can be applied to space. All right. So for example, you know, space is leveraging on the ability to do focal plane wafer control. It could potentially take advantage of that new method that I described called linear dark field control. The chronographs that we're testing out on the ground can be applied in space. So for example, we've tested out a particular design of chronograph on Subaru called the shaped pupil chronograph, which is exactly the type of chronograph that the Roman Space Telescope was planning on using. So the two are kind of harmonious in that way. And, they all, and also the ground can provide targets that, space, that a space-based mission can later look at. So it's not just really that one usurps the need for the other, but the two are sort of uh, complementary. And also the ground can aid the maturation technology. We need to be able to image planets in space much better. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, we, um, if you have any questions, please paste them in the chat. I'm now going to turn it taking questions, and hopefully Dr. Curry can stay on with us for a little while longer. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley and William to give us a virtual tour of our, faci of our facility. And um, uh, 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 Dr. Curry, if you can stop sharing your screen, we'll hand over the screen sharing to um, uh, William. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed that wonderful talk by Dr. Curie. I know I did. So we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to the virtual tour part of the evening. So if you live in uh, Northern Virginia, you might know that we are a little bit cursed with bad weather. So it's particularly uh, cloudy and just kind of icky out tonight. So unfortunately, we are unable to open the shutter and take a look at a live view of anything in the night sky. However, we do have a set of pictures we have imaged beforehand that we can show you and we can also show you around the observatory as well. So what you're looking at now uh, is just a boring black desktop, but we are actually connected to one of the computers uh, at the observatory. So what do I want to say here? So this, uh, we're connected to the uh, computer via team viewer and it basically lets us have full control over the telescope. We can do pretty much anything we want from the, to it, uh, from the comfort of our own home. So one thing that's very critical for not only tours, but also just for safe usage of the telescope is a set of three webcams we have uh, at the observatory. So if I just pull those up, what we have here are a set of three views. So these are live image views of various uh, places at the observatory. So in the top right, what we have is the control room. And if I zoom in on this, you can see that we are connected 
well, you can't really see, but you'll take my word for it, that we're connected to this computer uh, towards uh, the middle left right here. So that's what we're currently connected to. And you'll notice that we have another, uh, you can see the keyboard at least, we have a second computer down here, which is in theory a clone of the main computer that we use. So this is uh, the primary computer we use off to the left up here is, you know, the primary one that we use day to day. And we do all of our software testing and Windows updates on this other computer. Uh, one interesting fact is that a few months ago, we actually had a Windows 10 update break uh, some of our drivers, and we were unable to uh, use the telescope for a solid three months. So uh, Windows 10 uh, definitely gives uh, problems uh, for everyone. So uh, anyways, this, uh, like I said earlier, is the control room. It's where students uh, will spend most of their time if they are uh, observing on campus. So it's a very cozy room. Uh, everyone says uh, they're going to get their homework done in there, but usually we just end up watching movies and not being productive. So anyways, um, moving on from there, if we go uh, down, uh, we have a camera with no signal. That one's in a box, so we don't really expect a signal from that. And to the bottom left, we have an outside view of the dome and the roof of Research Hall. So it's a little difficult to get a sense of scale here, but the door frame it's about six and a half feet tall, roughly, I think. So that might give a little bit of a scale. But anyways, you can see uh, the silver dome on top of the concrete uh, structure. And we also have this kind of thing jutting off of the dome. And that is the shutter that will open up uh, the top part. You can see it's kind of segmented into two. The top part can retract. Then the bottom part will fold out. So we would... Uh, if the sky was clear, we'd be able to open this and do some uh, observing, but unfortunately, uh, that's not really feasible tonight. So lastly, uh, in the last camera, we have our telescope. So this telescope is a 32 inch reflector telescope. So when someone says a telescope is 32 inches or however many inches, they're generally referring to the diameter of the primary mirror. So the primary mirror, uh, you're kind of looking at it right now. It's uh, peeking out in the back of the tube. Uh, it's the very, very shiny thing at the back there. So like I said, that's uh, 32 inches or about 0 0.8 meters in diameter. And that's a fairly large uh, telescope. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, public ex publicly accessible telescopes on the East Coast. And yeah, for most people, it is a large telescope, but this telescope itself actually is very small compared to some of the largest telescopes in the world. So remember I said this was about 0.8 meters in diameter, whereas uh, some of the largest telescopes in the world can be about 10 meters in diameter, so about 10 times larger than this one. So anyways, uh, this is a reflector telescope, meaning that it uses mirrors instead of lenses. So the way light is going to travel through this telescope is we have um, the light coming in through the uh, big opening and it'll bounce off the primary mirror. And then it'll bounce up to this uh, secondary mirror. You can see how that's uh, supported with that uh, cross bracing there. And it'll bounce off the secondary mirror through a hole in the primary mirror. And then it'll bounce off a diagonal reflector mirror into one of the four portholes we have on the other side of the telescope. So that allows us to channel uh, light into one of the four, in theory, four instruments uh, we have mounted on the uh, back of the telescope. So if we go ahead and flip the telescope over, uh, we can show you the instruments that are currently mounted on it. So Justin, if you could go ahead and uh, flip the telescope, thank you. So the software uh, Justin is using is called the SkyX Pro. It's uh, a beautiful interface. Uh, what you're seeing uh, off to the right is a projection of the night sky as it appears to us. It's essentially like a uh, mini uh, planetarium and we can literally just point and click on any object we see in the sky and we can tell it to go there. Alternatively, uh, we can also enter uh, the name of the object and if it recognizes the name, we can just hit it and go or we can also just input a uh, right ascension and declination. So fairly standard controls. 
So while the telescope is moving, uh, I'll say a couple other things about it. So a lot of people think uh, when I ask this question uh, in person, uh, a lot of people guess that the telescope price tag is about um, in the million dollar range, I wish. Uh, the telescope itself is actually only about $300,000. The dome is about $80,000, and between 2017 and 2019, there were about uh, a hundred, there's about $150,000 worth of upgrades put into the telescope. Right, so you can see as the telescope turns, we can get a, a different view. So you, we have this fork-like structure that's responsible for turning the telescope in any sort of direction. So the fork that you see there is about a thousand pounds. The telescope itself is about a thousand pounds. And then the base of the telescope is about another 2000 pounds. So as this is flipping over, the instruments are coming into view and that's quite a nice view. Okay. Can go ahead and enlarge this. All right, so at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and let Ashley uh, talk about the instruments. Thanks, William. Um, so what we see here are some of the instruments that, the tele that we can use to look at objects in the sky. So like William said, um, the way light travels through the telescope, it bounces off the primary mirror, bounces up to the secondary mirror, and bounces back to that hole in the middle of the primary mirror. And that hole is where the light is directed to these four little terminals. Um, here we have the traditional IP. Oh, you might not be able to see me. Hold on. We can see your mouse. That looked good. Oh, you can? Okay. Yeah. So here is the traditional eyepiece. It is um, what we would be looking at if we were in the dome tonight and looking up into the sky. Um, traditional way of looking at things. Um, and then up here in the, um, on the opposite side, we have the CCD, which is basically a really fancy camera that takes images of whatever object that the telescope is pointed at. Um, now, when I say fancy, I mean it's 16.8 uh, million pixels fancy. So that means it can take a picture with 16.8 million pixels, and that costs about, and the Overall, the camera cost about $10,000. So it's about $10,000 worth of fancy. <laughs> so now when we look at things, we can look at them in different uh, filters of light. So this silver thing connected to the box is a uh, filter wheel that contains, um, holds seven different filters that we can look at objects with. Now, just for um, this little black box is actually a uh, spectrograph which splits light into different um, colors. So we can do research with that. And then the last one is, the last, um, the last port is actually empty right now. So that is our telescope. Um, so to move on, actually, we're going to look at a few objects that we have taken pictures of with our telescope. Let me see. So first we're going to start with, oh, where did they go? We are going to start with the largest planet in our solar system, good old Jupiter. So Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun and it is the largest planet in our solar system at about 300 times the mass of Earth. So what you're looking at are two pictures of Jupiter, one taken from our telescope. Let's see if I can get Jupiter into view. This one was taken with our telescope um, on a good night. And you can see the characteristic bands that um, along, the, uh, along uh, the surface of Jupiter. Um, and then the image on the left is an image taken from um, 
a colleague um, off of his own personal equipment. And you can see that the quality of this image is a little bit better than the quality of ours. Our telescope isn't really suited to looking at planets. Uh, so we get um, a little bit of distortion when we take pictures of them. So a little bit more about Jupiter. Um, it's characterized by this big red spot, um, which is a storm where winds can reach up to 350 miles per hour. Uh, to give you a little context, uh, Category 5 hurricane is about 150 miles per hour, so the winds in that storm are more than double that, and the storm's been going on since the 17th century, uh, around when it was discovered. So uh, Jupiter is a very large but also a very powerful planet, um, which kind of benefits us here on Earth. Uh, Jupiter has such a strong gravitational pull that it can actually protect the inner planets of our solar system from extrasolar asteroids and materials and whatnot. So it works kind of like a big slingshot and it catches things and shoots them out into, um, out of the solar system. Um, but it also has the ability to capture some organ, some, um, not, sorry, I'm a chemistry major. So if I say organisms, please forgive me. <laughs> um, so it, Jupiter can actually catch some of these extrasolar objects and um, it uh, kind of helped it build its uh, impressive array of over 67 uh, satellite objects that surround the planet. So you can kind of see here in this um, left image, a few little dots um, on, the, on the picture. And those are actually three of uh, Jupiter's Galilean moons. Uh, the Galilean, Jupiter actually has four Galilean moons, and they're called Galilean moons because they were discovered by Galileo when he looked through his telescope at the planet. So Jupiter's moons include Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, and like I said, you can kind of see a few of them in this image here. Um, Io, the innermost planet, the innermost um, moon, um, is very unique because it's actually volcanically active and this volcanic activity activity actually creates um some interesting colors let me see if i can nope. pull up an image here we go Here's an image of Io. This was not taken with our telescope. Uh, this is just an image for your reference. Um, but you can see the really interesting greens and orange and reds. And that's due to the volcanic activity um, that's happening on the planet. So, I mean, on the moon, sorry, not, not planet. <laughs> um, so Io, again, the innermost um, moon of Jupiter. Now the next moon is, here's an image of them. So the next Galilean moon is um, Europa, which is the smallest, and uh, it has a smooth solid surface due to the possibility of a subsurface ocean of liquid water beneath it. And um, where uh, there's the belief that where there's water, there could also be life. So it is a suspect of possible alien life in our solar system, though it has not been um, proven yet. Maybe someday there will be a mission to Europa to prove that we might not be alone in the solar system. And then Ganymede is the largest moon in um, our actually whole solar system. Of all the moons of all the planets in our solar system, Ganymede is actually the largest. And it actually has a slight magnetic field. And it's the only moon in the solar system to do so. And then good old Callisto is the oldest and the furthest out moon um, of Jupiter, Galilean moon of Jupiter, and it's also the most heavily cratered. So that's Jupiter, a really beautiful and powerful planet. Now, um, moving on to Jupiter's closest neighbor, we have the sixth planet from the sun, uh, Saturn, which is also known as a, which is also a gas giant. Uh, Saturn is actually my favorite planet because it has these really robust ring, this really robust ring structure that makes it shine so brightly in the sky. And the ring structure is mostly composed of water, 
water ice, rocky debris, and dust particles. Um, in other words, the rings really aren't solid. Uh, the main idea is that um, the rings are believed to be um, destroyed moons, asteroids, and comets that may have uh, blown, pa blown past the planet. And um, just a little side note, uh, you can see this was also not taken with our um, telescope. This is another stock image. But you can see the blue ring down at the bottom. That's actually the um, particles in the magnetic field of Saturn are excited, so they emit light. Uh, here we call them the northern light. Um, but on Saturn, you can see them glowing very nicely there. So along with the ring, Saturn also has more than 80 moons orbiting it. And that includes Titan and Enceladus. Uh, Titan is actually the largest of Saturn's moons, and it has a substantial atmosphere. Uh, uh, it also has rivers, lakes, and seas of methane and ethane. So uh, a lot of biologists actually think that um, Titan represents kind of a primordial Earth, because it's believed that uh, Earth's atmosphere evolved to what it is today from something similar to what appears on Titan. Um, and then Enceladus is the sixth largest of Saturn's moons, but it's also very important because it has this really reflective, shiny surface. Um, and it also has these geysers that um, contribute to, um, that, spew out, that spew out water. So Enceladus also is believed to have a um, subsurface ocean, and these geysers can spew out water into space, and most of it falls back down on Enceladus, but some of it can actually contribute to the rings of Saturn, um, Saturn's E-ring specifically. So that covers a couple of familiar objects in our solar system. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to uh, William to discuss some things that are a little bit further away. Thank you. Oh, Ashley, before we move on, though, could you show uh, a couple pictures of Saturn that we did take with our telescope, just because we didn't yes. uh, see those? Yeah. Here we go. Here is an image of Saturn that we took with our telescope. And again, you can still see that really, really nice ring structure. Obviously not in as much detail. Uh, we don't have uh, the imaging capabilities of, you know, some of the, you know, top tier uh, spacecraft in the world. But, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, this just really underscores how difficult it is to get nice, pretty images of uh, the planets. So. What we're going to do now is take a look at the Whirlpool Galaxy. So we have a few images of that. So let's mosey on over here. So let's see, here is a good one. So that's a black and white image. And then we have, uh, yeah, we can do this one. It's a nice colored image. And then lastly, we have this image. Let me just situate these a little better. Okay. Oops, you can go away. Did I lose my image? Oh no. Where did you get to, buddy? There we go. All right. So uh, towards the right of the screen, we have a black and white image of the, um, of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And then in the middle, we have a colored image of the Whirlpool Galaxy. So these two images were taken with our telescope. They were processed uh, by students here. And then the image on the left, the one that's a little bit higher quality, was taken by uh, Dr. John Prune, a former uh, student at GMU. So you can see that one is quite a bit more detailed. But the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy was actually discovered in the late 1700s by Charles Messier, who was going around uh, cataloging objects that could be confused with comets. And he has this long list of uh, objects that are uh, 
some galaxies, some of them are star clusters. And uh, so sometimes we refer to the Whirlpool Galaxy by its Messier object catalog numbers or catalog number or M51. But regardless what you want to call it, we can see that it's a beautiful spiral galaxy that's interacting with a smaller safer galaxy. So a safer galaxy is just an active galaxy with a supermassive black hole at its core that is accreting matter. The galaxy itself is about 23 million light years from Earth and about 75,000 light years in diameter. So the Whirlpool galaxy is a great example of a spiral galaxy because we have these really beautiful uh, spiral arms right here and these denser parts of the arms are where we have lots of gas, dust, and uh, star forming uh, going on. So that's what's happening in those uh, slightly more defined uh, areas of the spiral arms. You have this, uh, these regions of star formation going on there. So another thing that uh, is very interesting about the Whirlpool Galaxy that you probably noticed is this little uh, light uh, off in the corner, and that is a separate galaxy. And it's actually interacting with uh, the main uh, galaxy, with the main Whirlpool Galaxy. So you can kind of see, uh, particularly in the image on the far left, uh, there's uh, an arm off the uh, main uh, or primary galaxy that's interacting with uh, this uh, smaller galaxy. So this is an excellent uh, object uh, for astronomers to use to study how uh, galaxies uh, interact in a merger kind of environment. So um, one last thing to say is just how we uh, briefly uh, went from this black and white image to a colored image. So uh, Ashley earlier, uh, when she was describing our camera or CCD, she mentioned that we have a variety of filters. So if we go and take a live image uh, with our CCD, it doesn't matter if we're going to use a red filter, it doesn't matter if we're going to use a blue filter or an infrared filter, no matter what we use, the image is always going to come back to us as black and white. What we can do to colorize that image is just take uh, an image in uh, various different uh, wavelengths or filters. So commonly we would choose a red, uh, a red filter and then a blue filter and then a green filter. And then we would stack those images together and create uh, some kind of colored image. So in a nutshell, that's how you would uh, create uh, one of these colored images. So that's uh, what I want to say about the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, are there I know we've said uh, a lot of uh, stuff uh, up to this point, so are there any questions that anyone has, or can we keep on going? All right, looks like there's not many questions in chat. So the yeah, last- if you, have, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the, in the chat, and we'll be uh, wrapping up uh, fairly uh, soon. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around and joining us tonight. Okay, uh, back to you, William. Great, thank you. So the last thing I uh, will show is just a transit light curve. So we can do a uh, very interesting research at the observatory. So we can contribute to active uh, missions. So let me go ahead and pull this up. So one of the, or the main type of research we do at the observatory is a uh, follow-up of extra, or follow-up of possibly uh, transiting exoplanets. So uh, there was a new uh, NASA mission launched uh, called TESS, uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And TESS is uh, surveying uh, the night sky and it's looking at stars and it's uh, checking if these stars have periodic dips in brightness. If a star is uh, experiencing periodic dips in brightness, then that means uh, something is uh, blocking that light and that something could be a planet. Of course, it doesn't have to be a planet, so it flags the object as a potential uh, kind of candidate and it will send it down for uh, follow-up uh, by other observatories. 
And we are uh, one of the observatories that will go and stare at a target that Tess has found, and we will see if uh, we see the same thing that Tess uh, saw. So this is not actually a light curve uh, from Tess. We actually should get one of those uh, in our folder here to showcase. But this is a very, very pristine and beautiful uh, light curve. So on the horizontal axis, we just have time. So as we just go to the right, uh, we're just increasing in time. Then vertically, we just have the amount of light we are getting from that star. So this is a very telltale sign of a transiting planet. So that's what the top of blue is showing. And then we have uh, some other dots uh, around here. And those are just reference stars in our uh, field. So if I can just pull this up, that's not it. So when we are analyzing this data, what we do is we place uh, some apertures or just some kind of uh, targets on the star we're interested in, and we also place a bunch of reference uh, apertures on a bunch of nearby uh, similar stars. And the reason for that is to uh, determine if the change in brightness we see from the star we care about is real. So if uh, this, uh, the star we care about changes in brightness, but most or all of the stars in the frame uh, that we have selected also change in brightness, then it's uh, probably just due to something like atmospheric effects. Uh, but if it's only uh, this uh, target star that changes in brightness, then there's uh, a good, better chance that the dip in brightness is actually real and caused by something that's going in front of that star. So these, uh, these few dots right here, they're just uh, light curves from some of these reference stars, and you can see that they're quite flat, so there's nothing uh, going on there in terms of transits. So with a transit light curve, uh, we can tell uh, quite a few things. Uh, in particular, if we know the radius of the star, we can actually get the radius of the planet. If we do uh, some more follow-up uh, with uh, a different uh, technique called the radial velocity technique, we can get uh, constraints on the mass. And then we uh, can also use uh, that information with mass, the radius of the planet, no mass, no volume. We can get a kind of crude estimate of the density of the planet. So, if we have multiple uh, transit uh, light curves, we can also uh, estimate the period of the uh, planet. And of course, we can also uh, get the uh, semi-major axis of the planet with Kepler's third law. So we know how far away uh, the planet is uh, from its sun. So, uh, very cool stuff. So we do a lot of transit follow-up. Uh, it's the main uh, form of research that we do here. So there have been uh, other uh, attempts uh, at research. In particular, one of the graduate students uh, tried to do microlensing. Uh, I don't, I can't remember what his results were, but uh, it wasn't good enough for us to keep <laughs> keep doing it. So we mainly uh, look at uh, transits. So. I think uh, that's everything I wanted to say about that. Uh, unless there are any questions, uh, I think that's all uh, we have to show tonight, unless Ashley wants to show anything else or add anything more. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Ashley and William. Also, thank you to our speaker, Dr. Thing. Uh, we will be uh, posting when the uh, speaker gives us permission, a copy of this talk on our website, which you can share with others. And thank you all for coming tonight. Have a good evening and we'll see some of you on Tuesday of next week with our Smith Associates, Dr. Natalie Hinkle. And again, in two weeks with uh, Dr. Benny Haldera. Take care everyone and good night. Good night.